president of the Delaware Beekeepers Association. That's for the entire state, right? There's only three counties in it. It's a little state. <laughs> but Ken was kind enough to come and talk to us at this meeting about breeding local bees. And um, I don't know if I've said it enough times, but this year we're trying to make the theme of every meeting have something to do with uh, local bees and queens. So we're kind of calling it the year of the local bee. Um, so that's going to be a running theme throughout our meetings. And we appreciate you, Ken, and thanks very much for coming on. So um, I was thinking, you know, my strawberries need more pollination. And so a friend of mine was a beekeeper, and I asked him to bring his, his hive or hives over. And he was like, eh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't that. Okay, I'll get my own then. <laughs> and so that's how it all started. Um, and also, uh, Sudan so says, I uh, teach biology. Um, so, you know, biology, bees, is kind of, you know, marriage. So I uh, got into um, about three years of losing my bees over the winter and thinking, man, this is starting to get a little expensive. And I thought to myself, okay, let me study up on this and see if I can do this myself. And so that's kind of how I got to where I am today. Um, so first of all, um, my interest was uh, I wanted to raise quality queens. And I think um, you know, I, I coach some, and, and I'm kind of competitive, so I didn't want to get into this and be like, oh, man, this queen stinks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be that guy. So, you know, I said, man, I want to really raise quality queens. So um, I did a little research, and so for one whole winter, um, I was just, like, reading everything I could get my hands on. So I read about ten books, and uh, some of them were, you know, very popular ones. Um, but, uh, you know, I read and I read and I read. And for a while, the more I read, the more confused I got. But um, there were some nice small books that I liked. Uh, Larry Connor has a whole series on uh, Queen Ring Essentials, b sex Essentials, Increase Essentials. Um, they were kind of small books, and it allowed me to understand the bigger books once I read them. So I also perused a lot of websites and just spent a lot of time trying to educate myself on how to raise queens and how to raise them well. Um, so getting into that, there are three main reasons why bees make more queens. Uh, the first one is procedure. So the queen's pheromone starts to diminish a little bit. Uh, she doesn't lay as well. Uh, her performance is just not up to snuff. And they sense that and they replace her. Um, sometimes when they replace her, sometimes before they extinguish her, um, you might have two queens running around in a hive. Uh, I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, wow, this is, this is great, you know. Tons of brood, hey, you know, <laughs> two queens. Um, so it's a procedure. The other one, the one we all hate, the reason why we are beekeepers, is to prevent swarming. Um, and that's another reason why. Their, brood, their, uh, their nest, their cat, their hive gets crowded. They fill it up with nectar, uh, they fill it up with brood, uh, she's like, hey guys, I'm out of space, and they're like, okay, let's split, and they do. Uh, and we want to try to prevent that from happening. And finally, emergency. Maybe we do something and we kill the queen, or who knows, maybe some natural thing happens and the queen dies. And so the bees will raise a queen. So out of the three reasons, what we want to do as beekeepers raising quality queens is we want to replicate two out of three reasons. And we don't want to go and make a queen week, so the procedure's not really a choice. But we can put them in a situation where they want to swarm, and where they're in an emergency where they have no queen, and now we can raise good quality queens. And one thing just to think about is, um, when do bees raise their queens? In the swarm season. So in the swarm season, they have all the nectar and pollen and the population that they need, so um, that's a great time to do it. Um, you want to think about, like, what is the criteria that you want to look for when you're thinking about which queen do I breed from? 
And so, you know, is it your best hive? Uh, that's probably the one to choose. Uh, good build up, I like that. I like pulling frames out early on and seeing a nice blue pattern early because a good build up does lead you to more honey production. Might be a good thing you're into. You don't want to pop the top and have them fly in your face. A temperament's a good thing, you know. Uh, probably here in the city, might that might be a good thing too. I don't know how the neighbor thing goes, but maybe. Uh, hygienic behavior, how well they clean. Uh, that's, a, that's a great trait. And then longevity, um, how long they live. So you can think, like, if they don't live very long, that's probably not a good trait. But if they live a while, that might be something worth looking at. Um, so as I read and I read other beekeeper stuff, a guy talked about the importance of marking your queens. If you mark the queen with the corresponding color for that year, you'll know how old she is. And so, like, I had this one thing, like, here, she's still around. I thought, hey, she must have something some of those don't. And so I read <coughs> her for, uh, for a while. Okay, so, you know, sometimes if you have one hive, that's the hive you pick. It just depends. And those are the decisions that you get to make. There's a ton of different methods. Um, do little is where you graft the larvae um, out of the cell into a queen cell. Uh, the Miller method is one I'm going to um, propose maybe that you might want to try later on. Um, the alley method is where you basically take a frame out and, you know, worker cells are built in a horizontal fashion. Queen cells are built in a vertical fashion. So this guy, I can't remember his first name, but Allie was his last name. He said, okay, we can take a frame out, turn it like this, and put it over top the top bars, and let the bees draw these cells down. Yeah. Work for him, and I've seen it work for a lot of people. Self-punch method. This is basically where you take a piece of tubing or something, and you actually go in and you punch out a cell, and then you kind of glue it down with wax in a vertical fashion, somewhat like this and you raise queens that way, no grafting involved. The Gentra method is a popular newer method where you have a plastic box, you put your queen in a plastic box, she lays in the plastic cells, you, four days, you take them out, you put them on a cell bar, and you don't have to graft there either. And then the first method I tried, because it was pretty simple, is on the spot queen rearing. And that's simply, you just pull your queen out and let the hive do the rest. And that's pretty simple. I can talk about like if you get the best queens that way or not, but it's a pretty simple way. It's the way I first started. One of the keys you want to know about if you're going to try this is it's all about timing. And this is the the bad thing about it. Like you if it's raining and it's day ten, you gotta do your thing. Okay? So I don't know what you know, but uh, the queen lays an egg in the cell and it's an egg for like three, three and a half days. And it will actually stand up, it's actually horizontal, but if you think about it, when we look in there, it's standing up. So after three days, it's fallen over and actually hatches into a larva. You want to graft that larva if you're grafting, and this may not be the, this is your, if you're like, you know, not really accomplished or whatever, and then a well, grafting's not the first method you pick, okay, it's kind of hard. So. Um, but this is when the bees would turn a worker cell, worker larva, into a queen, like three and a half days. So you'd scoop it out, you put it in your queen cup, and you would go about. The thing you want to notice is that uh, in green, there's a 10-day cycle from when you start it, or the bees start it, to when it's time to do something with it. That 10-day period is going to be important uh, when you're going to do the, an easier method I'm going to recommend here later. 10 days is important. Now, here's the other thing. Um, so 10 days, then about day 16, she hatches out. She walks around the hive, she hardens up, they feed her, she takes her mating flight, and then she's laying. So basically, a month. That's a while. So, I think in, in Suzanne's uh, letter it said that uh, the raising noose was, um, uh, a better alternative because there's a lot of work. Queen rearing is a lot of work. Um, so maybe I'll talk about that later too. But I'm just going to run through this um, because you may not be trying this. But grafting is where you actually take a tool 
Um, this is like an older tool, and a lot of these pictures I just pulled off the internet because I had an accreditation, you know, a couple years ago. But I use a Chinese graphing tool that allows you to get um, royal jelly and the larva. This is an older type, and you just pick up larva up with that. But anyway, you transfer the larva into um, queen cups, and then they start to draw them out. When you're looking for the appropriate age larva, here you can see the eggs that are standing up, if you will. Here you can see there are larvae that are clearly evident. They have a C-shape, they're kind of large. These are too old, those are too young. You want to look for something in the middle, okay? I was reading from some of those books, and one guy said, you know, once you get over 40, you may want to go to the drugstore and get yourself a pair of, of readers. You know, I was 40 thinking, yeah, this guy, I don't know what he's talking about. Then I got like 40 couple, and I went to the, the drugstore and got some you know? And it was like, these things, here's the thing, you can't, you can't grab that egg, but the larva is going to be the size of a comma in the newspaper. It's going to be tiny. And so you, even if you have really good vision, it's probably a good idea to get a pair of uh, uh, magnifiers of some sort. So you would pick this up and you would put this in your queen cell. Now, this a, letter, a better view is here's a little close up. Here's an egg, there's a larva. It's in a small pool of royal jelly. This is a little different um, graphing tool. Um, still not the one that I use, but you want to try to get the uh, larva and the jelly that it's sitting in. And then therefore that larva never comes out of contact with royal jelly. Because if there's a break in the royal jelly, there's going to be a break in the quality of the queen that you can get. Okay, so, you know, that's just, that's just part of it. So, anyway, appropriate age larva. Sometimes, depending on if you're going to raise a bunch or a few or however many, uh, you have a cell bar frame. And this is where you transfer the larvae into these cups, and you're going to put this in a hive, which I'm going to show you here in a second. But that's just a piece of equipment you would use if you were grafting. One of the easiest ways to get them going is you make a starter box. And again, these are pictures that allow me to show you a starter box. This is a new and it's open here. Your starter box is not open. You're going to trap the bees in there for 24 hours. You're going to load the thing up with as many bees as you can get. And you have to have appropriate age bees. They need to be nurse bees. You need to shape probably at least a super or a hive body of nurse bees into a new. How you do that? You find wet brood that they're feeding, and you shake them in, and you go frame after frame after frame. In this, you also want a frame of pollen, a frame of nectar, and two drawing frames, uh, just to take up the bee space. You'll have one left over, and that's where you're going to stick that grafting frame in there. But, you know, there's different examples. The whole point is they have to be loaded with bees. A high density, as Michael Bush would say. Um, you, or have a, you have the larvae in there for about 24 hours, and then you're going to transfer it to a finisher. Now, a finisher hive is basically a larger hive that you break down and you crowd the bees. Like swarming was the thing we talked about replicating. You want to crowd them so they want to swarm. If they want to swarm, they'll build queen cells, and they'll build them very well. So you need a high population of bees in your finisher. And they'll be in here for... Uh, till about the 10th day uh, from when you graft it. So these are going to draw, they're going to finish them off, they're going to incubate them, um, and you want to pull them out before they hatch. Because you all know what happens when one hatches, right? <laughs> then you get one queen, and you did a bunch of work. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for, um, you know, drawn queen cells, and now we can transfer that into a nuke or whatever you choose to uh, start with. Okay. One of the things you want to look for when grafting is, you may not see this first of all, but you can look and see that this blue cell is white all the way, that is packed with royal jelly. This one, yeah, that's pretty good, but it's not packed. Some of these other ones, this one's about half full. Okay, down here, this is close, but they're not full. You want these cells to be packed full of royal jelly, more royal jelly than those larvae can consume. They never run out of high quality feed, and that's one way you're going to get to quality queens. Another good sign of quality, well-fed queen is the cells are sculptured. 
have divot taught like a golf ball. This is another indicator of well fed. Uh, a lot of times on your frame, uh, they'll actually draw a cone in this empty space because there's so much feed available. And that's the thing. They're, swarm season's a great time. So you have to reproduce that by giving them sugar water or pollen substitutes or frames of pollen or nectar. Um, you've got to have all the resources uh, to build or make poly queens. Then you're going to transfer it to a, uh, to a frame. You can stick it into wax like this one. You can put it on top of the cell bars of a mating loop like this. Um, this. These are easy ways to have that thing hatch out into whatever you're going to put it into. Probably you ought to put it into a mating new. Five frames, three frames, two frames. I'll show you that in a second. Now, the reason why it's good for you to be able to make your own queens is you're going to call somebody up in where? Down south or you're going to, wherever you call them up from. It doesn't really matter. Um, they are going to, well, I'll get one second ahead of myself. These are uh, California mini cages, and you can allow, you can let your queens hatch out in here, and then you can screen them. Because, you know, if someone wants, a, uh, wants an Italian, and you send them a yellow bee, why, well, well it's probably Italian. Or if you want a carniolan, and they get a dark bee, well, it's probably a carniolan then. Uh, so anyway, you get to screen and you get to look large, small, coloration, stripe, solid color. You get to evaluate them. Um, I don't do this, but some people do. You can also put them in an incubator. And so here you see this queen cell hatches out, and this is a beautiful queen. Uh, but she hatches out in the incubator and not in a hive. Uh, I don't do this either, uh, because I want her to be taken care of as soon as she comes out by other bees. But if you're mass producing them, Sometimes resources are on a premium, so you might incubate them. Now, regardless, every queen, there's only one queen in a hive. So when you're making queens, you need to be have a mating nuke for every queen. So every one of these is a mating nuke. Okay? And these are some parent hives um, that they probably came from. Now here's the thing. For every queen, in this case, you need five frames. Or how many do you got? start with. So if you've got to have five frames from a parent hive, we're now talking about are, are you going to be making any honey? So you kind of got to choose what direction you want to go. Okay. And you know how they say like it takes money to make money? Well it takes bees to make bees. And so resources are very important. Now some people say well you know what if I have five frames that's five frames I need or I could make three frames and that queen can hatch out in fewer resources. Good idea. So you don't have to go five frames. As a matter of fact, um, I'm sure you admit it, you can go way less than five frames. Um, here's a mating new uh, mating yard, and you can see that these uh, nukes are facing, this is this way, and that's facing the other way. The hole is this way. That way when the queen goes out and mates and comes back, she doesn't get confused. Because if she goes to the wrong one, and there's two in there, then you lost one. Um, same way with here, these are mating nukes, these are different colors, and you saw the kids' hives over there. They're also facing different directions to make sure that um, the queens don't come back into the wrong nuke. Now, um, I put the slide in there to show you different colors, different directions, feeding, but here's the main thing. Um, a lot of commercial producers, it kind of depends on who you talk to, say styrofoam mating nukes. And there are wooden frames up top here, kind of like top bar hives. It takes one cup of bees. Put one cup of bees in here, sugar water in there. They draw these top bar frames down. You put your queen cell in there, it's a one cup of bees. Not a frame, not three frames, not five frames, but one cup. That's conserving resources. So, um, but at the end of the season, you get all those little teeny cones, what you, then what you do? And uh, probably start over next year, I don't know. But I don't, I don't use those either, but they're something you can do. Um, if you were a commercial uh, queen rearer, like somebody you find in a magazine, you're producing all these queens, and then what do you do with them? Because we're talking about resources. So what they do is they bank them. And so here, you can see there's approximately 30, I forget how many do it, about 30 queens are being held here, okay? This is, like sometimes, you know, packages don't really 
the packages, people are satisfied with packages. You know, sometimes the queen gets superseded, sometimes they don't make it, sometimes she's a drone layer. Well, if you think about this whole process, you call somebody up, hey, I need a queen, okay, I ship her out tomorrow. So they go to this bank, and we don't really know how long she's been in here, but they go to the bank, they put her in a cage, they ship her to you, so she's in the mail to you the second day. Okay? Maybe the third day, this is kind of the second day. You take her out and you put her in your hive the next day. And then two days later, they eat the candy and release the queen. So she's been held up four or five days. And that's really saying, before we talk about how long she's been in there. Well, I don't know, like I've been, I've coached sports for about 25 years. Uh, I know people have race horses. And I know like when you're training athletes or you're training race horses, you work them up to the, to the competition date. Well, your queen is like an athlete or a racehorse. You want that queen to develop, 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 develop. And so if you take her in her premium maturation time and you put her in a bank, it's like saying to that racehorse, hey, you know, I know we got a race in a week or two, but why don't you go and stay with her a little while? Just hang out, you know? What results do you expect to get? If you, if you cut the most important queen in the hive, if you cut her maturation off and have her stop laying, her ovaries or, or ovarials will not perform as they would if you trained her the whole time. So queen banks, in my opinion, um, are not good. And you know, I, I, I wouldn't bank the queen. Um, here's some other banks, you know, whatever. Here's, here's what I do. I have um, a 10 frame hive and I split it into four uh, sections. I put two frames in each one. So I only take two frames to raise one queen. Uh, it helps me to conserve resources. Um, you know, like I said, you could do a couple bees, but I don't, I don't know. I could, deep this is a deep, okay? But I can put a medium frame in there, and I can put it back in my hive, and I can switch things back and forth and if I, hey, if I find a cell, if I find a frame with a queen cell on it, like a swarm cell, what do I do? Throw it away? No. Stick it in there. Let her mature. Let her mate. Let her come back. There are holes on the, in the opposite side. Here's one hole. There's one. There's one. And there's one. So that way, when she flies out, she'll, she'll do an orientation flight, so she'll know what side of this box to come back on. But this works out very well. And you know, this is a, a nice little thing to have. And I just I made these with a table saw. And that's what that is, so if people want to see it after yep. they can come up and learn how to build. You know, and hey, if if something happened, you got a little behind and your hive made a couple queen cells, you got a chance to make more bees. If you got two queens laying versus one queen laying, you can make twice the amount of brood. So why, you know, this is a nice little tool to have. So what you said at the beginning, supersede period is the one of more than 10, but a queen is produced for, as if for a supersede period, you might as well take advantage of her if there's something wrong with her. Well, if they're superseding her, probably she or her pheromones and then she... But you're saying take the, what are the supersede your cells and put it in your new? Well, you want to get a, a swarm cell to put in your new. Um, like it's right on the bottom of the frame. Uh, there's no much more cells to be on the bottom of the frame. Okay. Your residual cells will be like above in the brood area, but towards the edge of the brood area. Okay, so, um, but either way, uh, it's a tool that you can use to make increase. Uh, this is um, this past December. So you see that short guy's me, and uh, here we have these uh, one box, and there's four queens in there, two frame hives in December. Um, it's amazing, I have done these little experiments, like how long will these go? Will these go all year? And so I've actually overwintered um, two framers over the winter, okay? Um, this, this, this winter, well, 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 we didn't have that great success. But um, either way, it was like an experiment. Let's try it, see what happens. Um, so here I'm opening them up. You can see I'm pointing the, the cluster in there, the cluster bees. This is this December, um, and here you can see um, there they are. And if we hadn't had such a crazy winter, they probably would have made it because they can share heat back and forth. Um, so that helps. Um, 
and the small cluster doesn't eat that much honey. So I'm, I'm not recommending you do this. Okay, this is just me experimenting. I'm a science teacher. You know? Is that the one you're using? Yes. Yes. So, um, yes. I think Mike Palmer does the same thing, but he cuts the side of the quarters. Um, yes, um, he has. Um, he has many friends. Yes, he does. This also is a kind of a similar concept because he overwinters nukes side by side. And he talks about how um, you don't just have like one cluster here and one cluster here, but you have two half clusters that make a whole cluster between the two boxes. And it's the same idea with this. They can share heat in a similar kind of way. Yep. Um, so here's some of my stuff. Um, this is a queen. She's marked white, so it's been a couple of years. But uh, you can see that uh, here's the edge of her wings. So her abdomen extends past her wings quite a way. She's quite large. Um, she was well fed. She was well reared. Uh, she had all the resources, all the carbohydrates, all the pollen, all the protein, uh, a lot of bees to feed her um, in her um, development. So nice and clean. You can see her brood pattern is also very nice. Okay, this was early, a couple years ago, this was early, like, it was March or April, but it was early, okay? Um, you can see the grass is not really, the grass is not really green so much. Um, so again, the root pattern is nice. Here's a different one, okay? And she's, you know, striped a little bit. Some people call it tiger stripe, but she's darker in general. Um, there's a cool thing. When you take one queen and you grab from one queen, all of her daughters don't look alike. This is the great, I love this. I love checking this out. Like, you know, when a queen mates, she'll mate with 10 to 20 drones. So you have like all these combinations that could result. And when you grab that little larva out of there, you have no idea what the genes are. It's a chance. And then so when you watch these things emerge and they look different, I find it fascinating. I love checking that out. Here's a great comment that I found when reading uh, Dr. Mueller Spyback and Barry Ruger's um, Queen Ring Manual uh, that poorly reared queens of productive stock generally will be inferior to well reared queens from less productive stock. Uh, we had Michael Palmer come down uh, last week to speak to us in Delaware. And uh, we were having dinner the night before. We got talking about queen rearing. And I said, yes. And there was this quote that was up with me from Dr. Farrar. And it was in this manual. And, he just quoted it, you know, verbatim. Um, this is well fed, well reared is more important than genetics. Um, and so the bees that you have that survive the winter, that's all you really need. Okay? So here's what I want to talk about what can you do to raise queens and not really have to graft. The first time I tried this, um, I followed this guy. I really can't pronounce his name, Mel. This is Poland. I, I can't, I'm not really sure how to pronounce the name. But the guy was, was on to something. And he is one to come up with on the spot queen rare. Um, he's got a pretty good technique. Basically, he just says, pull your queen out, let the bees make a new one. Now, what he says is that, and this is very true, this is an older comb, and bees have been in here and have left cocoons. Bees cannot chew through cocoons and turn a horizontal worker cell into a vertical queen cell. They cannot. So they have to pack royal jelly in there and float that larva out to then turn the cell down. Well, that's a lot of royal jelly. It's a long distance. Could the, could the larva come out of contact with the royal jelly? Yes. So what he says is you tear down the bottom third of the cell of the appropriate age larva. So you got to know that they're somewhere in the 12 to 36 hour old range. You tear the cells down, and hopefully they pick one of these and can now pull the cell down in a verbal fashion. So I tried this first. Um, I had a, down the road was a tree, a uh, storm, you know, half the, half the tree fell over. I was driving by one time, I looked up, caught my eye, and I saw comb sticking out of what was left. I'm like, oh man, what? Yeah. So I went back and I uh, tried to knock on the guy's door and said, hey, uh, would you mind if I got those bees? He said, help yourself. 
So I went home, I got my chainsaw, and I went and I, I got those bees. In like hours and hours and hours, and I got those bees. So anyway, I got them back, and the flow was over, whatever. They didn't, they weren't performing. And I'm like, these bees, man, they stink. And I'm thinking, that takes resources to make bees. And I'm thinking, I don't know, well, I don't want to sacrifice my honey, so I will sacrifice this honey. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to pull that queen out of there. I'm going to tear these cells down like this guy suggests. And I'm going to see what happens. And this was like, I don't know. It might have been two boxes, maybe. And I, so I did that. And next thing you know, that hive turned into four nukes. Wow. And I'm like, Durr, this is all right. I can do this. So then I started like, okay, what else? And I tried a cloakboard method. And, that I worked my way into grafting, but I thought, man, this is this is pretty cool. So how can we do that better? Well, if you know about the timing and the 10 days uh, that it takes to turn appropriate age larva into a queen that you need to get somewhere else, and the first queen out doesn't kill the rest of them, that 10 day period is important. You guys know about like um, foundational strains and stuff? Okay, well, here is, this is wax foundation. You can see the wire going through there. I don't really use that. You might, it doesn't really matter if you use that or not. But this will be, you can take a knife and you can cut this wax. You can't cut plastic. Okay, so this wax is fresh. No bees have ever emerged here. There are no cocoons here. There's an egg and there's some other eggs around here. If you have this scenario going on with a decent population, you could pull your queen out, put her in a nuke, they would make who knows how many queen cells. Three, four, ten, fifteen, who knows. So if you know the timing, you pull her out, ten days later you want to come back and you want to check out where they are. And so that's when you have to make your decisions. Because what's going to happen is they're going to be an emergency. Okay, here's the, um, I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Here is the foundation. You see a little starter strip right here? Uh, some people use a paint stirrer, some people use a popsicle stick. And then the bees will pull down the cone. And then if you have eggs in here or larva, this is beautiful. This is um, um, the Miller method. And he had a uh, cone that he actually cut in these points like this. And he let the queen lay in there. He pulled the queen out and they drew swarm cells off these edges. You can take a knife and cut them out. This is easy as anything. You can divide your bees up, put a queen cell in, and how many nukes you want to make. So, no grafting. You just have to know, 10 days after you pull that queen out, you've got to be back. Because if you're not, then one hatches, you'll have one queen. Which might be a bad idea either, but you could have more. So, you plan ahead. You say, okay, um, the nectar flow is going to be coming in. I want to get a good population, but before the nectar flow is over, I want to put my foundation of spray in there, or my wax foundation in there, and I want to have new wax. She gets eggs in there. You pull her out with maybe two frames of broom and maybe a frame of nectar pollen, and you put it in the new. Any old bees are going to fly back to the parent colony, okay? But if you have a queen here and you have a wet root, you know, not cap, but developing, then the nurse bees are going to stay with those and they're going to take care of those. And there'll be enough there to take care of the queen. And she'll continue to lay. And any flyers go back, and that's okay. It's totally fine. So, 10 days after you did this, you've got to come back and see where they are and what are you going to do with your queen cells. And like I said, if you do foundationless or you have wax foundations and they can stalk any way they want, you're going to be in business. One of the keys, and this is a thing I got from Michael Bush, is he talked about is uh, density of bees. You have a lot of mouths feeding a few queens. So if you had like two stories or three stories, you want to pack them down so that they are loaded, so they want to swarm, and then they're going to make queen cells, and that's what you want them to do. Okay, so this is um, an exaggeration or not, but obviously this thing's packed, and you want a whole bunch of mouths getting a few larva, and man, you're going to get something nice in return. So, you plan ahead. You put your foundationless in there. You put your wax in there, whatever. 
you know that there's eggs in there. You pull your queen out, you put her in a new. You check your parent hive 10 days later. And then, if you don't have any more equipment, then you say, okay, I don't want 10 queens hatching out and fighting it out, and potentially one of them takes off with half my bees. So then you go in there and say, okay, I don't have any more equipment, then I just take it, I knock them, I knock the cells down, destroy all the cells but two. And then the two of them can figure out who stays and who doesn't. And now you have a nuke and a brand new queen. And I'm going to tell you what, new queens lay eggs like it's nobody's business. They, I'm telling you what, they will, mm, they will knock your socks off. So here's your queen cells. This one's not even finished yet, okay? But you got to go back in 10 days because if one of these hat comes out and you're waiting on that one, you got one queen. You can take a knife, you can cut these out, and if you want to divide your brood up into like three more nukes, and you put a queen cell in each one or two queen cells in each one, you're going to have three nukes plus your original queen. You can take your hive and make four nukes. And then if one dies, okay, you still got three. If two dies, you still got two. If three dies, you still got one. I mean, what a deal. What a deal. You know? I mean, Michael Bush talked to us last week about sustainability. How do you not have to buy bees anymore? And so this is his, this is my take on his deal. And so, you know, I start out with one hive. You know, I learned how to rear queens, the next thing you know, I had 70. Like one year, I ran out of equipment, like, I don't know, 10 times. I was going to New Jersey, Harvey's like, yeah, need, uh, need 25 nukes. Hey, here you go. And I, I mean, I kept going back, and they're like, what's going on here? You know, I ran out of equipment. Do this, you know, and these new queens, man, you got to keep up with them. They can lay like crazy. So, you got one box, I'm good, though. No, you're not good. Go get some more. So, you're going to need it. Um, so, anyway, you just figure out what you're going to do with the queen cells. You know, maybe you only want two hives. So, you give them to a friend. You know, you, just, you have to decide what you're going to do with them. Here's a different one. You know, again, we're foundationless, we're natural comb. I mean, look at those things, man. Those things are beautiful. All right, they're gonna they're gonna be some be a fat queen in there, and a fat queen is gonna have some fat ovaries, and fat ovaries lay a lot of eggs. So, this is good stuff. Okay, so here's someone I don't know who this is. Again, I, I picture I got the internet, but you know, you start out with you start out with one eye, and now you have what? What do you you know? You want one new, you want two news. Okay, so if you have mites, and I don't treat, and I'm you get the 70 hives, and you're not, not treating, and then over a couple of years, you're kind of like, ooh, this shows a bad work. <laughs> but, you know, still have 50. So, that's good. <laughs> but if you have one, and you lose one, uh, the fun starts to fade. But, man, you know, I mean, you ever... <clears throat> I stopped selling queens. And I'm telling you what, you graft them, and then 10 days later, you know, well, then you, you have to, you grab them, and then you make a starter. You shake all these bees, you make a starter box. You put them in there. 24 hours later, you put them in a, a finisher colony. Nine days later, you put them in main nukes. Well, before you put them in main nukes, you got to make the main nukes up. So you steal bees from all your hives, you make up main nukes. The queens start laying, and they lay. So when you got a little hive and a queen, you got to check it a lot. And I'm like, working, 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 and somebody calls up, hey, can I get a queen? Oh, yeah, sure, come on over. Which one don't I want to save? Which one do I, you know, and, and once you have, like, you know, those four ways, and you got, like, ten of them, you got, like, 40 to choose from, you kind of forget which one is which. But I think to myself, man, I spent how much time, and she's going to walk away for $20. <laughs> My time is worth more than $20, let me tell you. So I transition to, I'm going to keep her in a nuke. And I'll sell the nuke next year for whatever. Okay. Uh, Michael Bush has told us that he sold 100 nukes to Better Be. I better not tell you the price. They, they, were, they were outrageous. Uh, better Be sold them like that. Supply and demand is crazy. But here's the thing if you have one hive and you lose it, yeah. and you could have done this, I mean, hey, that's sustainability. And that's what we want to do. We want to breed local bees that are acclimated to our climate. 
and you can treat or not treat, that's still your choice, but you don't want it to go buy them somewhere else. And you can simply do these techniques that I'm telling you now, and you can make your own pies. So there's plenty of methods, okay? You pick one, you give them a try, you get nothing to lose. Hey, what if your queen cells fail? You take that new with your queen, and you put it back in there, and you still got your more high. So you really don't have a lot to lose. Um, so anyway. Um, okay.
she comes out, she's yours, you know. That feels good. I mean, it just does. So, um, I've had a lot of fun with, with doing this. And I get attached to them. And I don't want to leave. <laughs> I made her. Well, they made her, but, you know. I knew the timing, you know. <laughs> I tricked them. Research has shown that it's not uh, beneficial any more or less. Some people will go 36 hours, um, but you know you have a limited number of bees in that five-frame nuke. So then you get it in a two or three-story hive that has you know five or six times the population to take care of them. That's way better. Um, so basically, that starter box gets them started and. Then you put them in a larger colony to, to finish the job. So why doesn't it just work? It's the same set of cells on the same cell bar, right? Right. And so why not just move them? Why not just put them straight into the big colony? Why is there a starter and a finisher? Well, because here's what happens. The starter has no queen. And as, I don't clean this phrase, but uh, as many beekeepers have said, they're, uh, they're desperate. They are hopelessly queenless. They are in emergency. They, they have to make a queen or they die. So if you have a colony that has a queen that's queen right, they're not in dire straits. They're like, eh, well, eh, no, I don't feel like it yet. <laughs> but you take a queen out, and they're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? <laughs> and do what you want them to do. So the starter really is, there are um, queen, queen breeders that do manipulations where they do queen right starter and finishers. Okay, so the, that's, there are so many ways to do this. Uh, but what I've found is that if you that starter box, it has no queen, no larvae, the only the larvae you give them, uh, they're, they have, they're hopelessly queenless. And and they have one job a month, one job only. Forget foraging. We got to feed these cells and make make a queen. And so you get a great start. How long do you have a queen? And that will start. Um. You you can do 24 hours, but you don't have to. Um, what I normally do is um. So I work in the daytime. I come home at night and I figure out what strong hive am I, I going to rob a deep or a super of nurse bees from. And then, so what I'll do is I'll make sure the queen's not on any of those frames, and I'll shake as many nurse bees as I can get in the nuke. Maybe two supers worth. I chalk that thing full. Um, and then, um, I live in an old farmhouse as a dirt cellar, so then I take it down into this dirt cellar. Now my nuke has screen on the bottom so they can breathe. If you have a ton of bees, you make a lot of heat, and you have to keep them cool. Um, Larry Connor talks about putting a wet sponge in there so they have moisture too. And um, so then I have in my basement. Well, then I go get the frame I'm going to graft from. I graft my cells. Once I have that cell bar grafted, I take it down to the basement. I wrap the box on the on some concrete blocks. The bees fall down. Pull the lid off. Stick them in. Put the lid on. They're hopelessly cleanless, and they have one job to do. And they're trapped. They cannot fly. And they're all the right age to feed. And that's key, is you have young nurse bees that you shook off wet food. So that's, that's, that's important. Yeah. Could you graft and put the queen cell in the starter before you dump the bees in the starter? Um, you could, but here's the thing. Those larvae are susceptible to drying out. Uh, it's a little desiccated. So when you when you graft, you, you really want to have wet paper towels. Like as soon as I put one larva into a queen cell, it's covered with a wet paper towel. Mm -hmm. And as I work down that cell bar, I'm sliding my wet paper towel down to keep moisture over all those larvae. Mm -hmm. When I take the larva out of my kitchen or wherever I am, and I put it in the starter, every bar is wrapped in wet paper towel. Right before I take that box, I wrap it on the the concrete block it's sitting on, 
So when air circulate, I take that wet paper towel off, wrap them down, pull the lid off, strip them in, and now they're going to be kept moist. If you um, go the other way, they can dry out. Yeah. yeah, because, I mean, how long is it going to take you to go through a super to shake bees in there? It's, it's going to take you a little bit. So, and plus, here's the other thing. That when, you, when you're grafting, those bees realize they don't have queen. And so, bless you. Um, so, you know, you could wait 24 hours, and they would really be in panic. So, uh, you don't have to, though. So... But, you know, what I was proposing with you about um, taking a starter strip and having um, uh, young eggs, aka larva, in that uh, fresh wax, I mean, you got everything you need there. You got all the nectar, you got all the pollen, you got all the bees, and they have no queen. They know what to do, and you're going to graft or anything. And it's a good way to start the first time. Um, and then you're like, I can do this, and then you can start grafting. Uh, but you got to start somewhere. And for me, I was like, you know, it was taboo. Like, you know, no one grafted queens. No one was a queen rearer in our area. You know, our inspector said, uh, I don't know if I'd try that if I were you. What? I can do that. I read 10 books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I read 10 books and still tried to do it without grafting. You know, I mean, it's, it's a thing. I didn't want to fail. You know, so. Yes? from me only a couple of bees. Because it's only like this big. Okay. So it is okay. Okay. it's tiny. Um, okay. and, and inside that little thing, one little part of it's where you put sugar water. And okay. you got like three kind of top bar frames. Okay. So the area is very small. Um, but it only takes a couple of bees. So it's all about resources. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. I'm not sure what your question is, but when I was reading some of this, and I'm, I'm like where you were at the very beginning, um, it said they need to put frames of pollen in so that they have the protein that they need to produce the royal jelly. Yes. So I, I'm not sure if you said that while you were going through it, but it, just in terms of the, what resources you need to make sure that they have what they need to. Okay, so when you're making up your starter, um, what you want to have is you want to have um, at least one frame of nectar and at least one frame of pollen. Um, depending on who you talk to, uh, they might tell you put them here, put them there. Uh, Michael Palmer, who talked to us last week, he wants them right next to his grafting frame. And that way the bees are, everything's right there. Um, I can't remember if it was Larry Connor or who it was, but somebody was talking about, you know, you can throw any outside and then fill in with drawn comb and then put your cell bar in there. I mean, you only got five frames. You got a ton of bees. They're going to share food no matter where it is. Um, but it does make sense, like my Palmer said, put everything right together. It should be nectar frame and pollen frame. When you, when, it, when you say pollen frame, are you talking about bee bread, which has had a chance to mature, or is it more fresh pollen, or how do you... Um, most people want fresh pollen. Uh, now, obviously not like they brought in today and hasn't fermented some, but you know, as soon as they bring it in, that process starts. Um, normally, like, you don't start queen rearing until dandelion uh, blossom, and that's still kind of on the early side. Um, but, you know, if you have a frame of pollen, it, that'll, there'll be enough mature bee bread there they can use. Yeah, some people say that bee bread is more, has more stuff in it that the, the, the bacteria in it sort of shove it into so yes. things that are much better for it. Yeah, well, what they do is, you know, that pollen is a protein yeah. made of, made of uh, amino acids. So you have bacteria and yeasts in there that ferment and they break those um, proteins down and then the bees can rearrange the amino acids into um, into their proteins for the royal jelly, uh, or subendivial glands, and paraendivial glands. So what, what do you think? I mean, what are you thinking when you put in a frame of what you call pollen? You're thinking this is good. This is bee bread, or you can sort of whatever you can find it is pollen of some sort. Well, you figure um, when dandelion pollen comes in, um, you're really starting to get nectar, and you're really starting to get pollen. 
So a lot of times when I'm doing this, it's dandelion pollen. And like I said, if you get a whole frame of pollen, you're going to have enough of the right age. Um, and, and, and you could have pollen and nectar together. So, um, yes? So when you're combining different frames of bees from actually different colonies uh -huh. in one box, do you do anything like they get along all right? Like you don't have to be newspaper? No. Nah. Um, the newspaper thing is for the queens. Okay, so I don't know where that one box was that I showed you. It was a four-way area yeah, right there. Um, you have, you have um, uh, four, basically two-frame hives. At some point, uh, if I sold a queen and I did not have a cell to put back in there, because I, mean, I don't raise queens all summer long, uh, what I might do is I might pull that divider out. And, you know, you have to have a divider because if the queen comes over, the queens will fight, but the bees won't fight. Um, there have been many beekeepers. I wouldn't do that in this scenario, but you could put a queen excluder over this, and as long as the queens couldn't go back and forth and fight, the bees, all four of these colonies, would store honey up above it. They would go and store and go back down and not fight, get along just well. So, uh, just well, as a teacher, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You said you had done experiments with people along with it. Keep this, like, mm -hmm. this. Uh -huh. So what does that really mean? Because they max out, are you adding the super below the chain splitter? So what is happening? Well, what I was trying to do is, can I overwinter them in two frames? So you raise the queen in the spring, mm -hmm. and then take out of these two frames scenario and then use this thing again over winter. Like well, they, they, up, down. well, they never really left here. But what I did somewhere along the way was if you got a young queen in two frames, she'll fill it up quick. I've had these things swarm on me okay. because well, they're switching out frames of oh, yeah. to give them the space. This is a lot of maintenance. Like a, lot of maintenance. a lot of maintenance. I mean, she like 1,500 eggs in a day. Well, they're also bringing the nectar so you you got to be on this. Like, I'm telling you, this is a lot of work. It's $20. It's not. <laughs> once a day? Twice a day? Yes, every, I mean, every other day? Uh, you might want to go like every every two, three days. You'll be checking on it. Every check the summer on Right. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing with your vacation. <laughs> yeah, this is a whole other job. Right. Hey, that's where I got. I, I was. I love beekeeping, right? And I kind of do this queen thing. I'm like, I gotta go to work again today. You know, it's summer, but it's a lot of work. Um, what are you looking for when you say you gotta check on them? You're looking for swarm cells? Oh well, you know, like I said, she like 1,500 eggs a day, 2,000 if she's really good. Well, I don't really know exactly how many cells are on one side of deep, but she can fill that thing up. I mean. A week, man, you're in trouble. A week, and they're making clean cells. Um, you know, the nectar flows on, pollen's coming in, and she's laying like crazy. you got to be on it. And here's the thing. You know, if you took a frame out of this one and a frame out of that one, and you had another box, there's two frames. So you can, har you can harvest brood out of here. You can put it in your big hive. You can put it in a new. There's things you can do, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, but this is the way you can hold queens for a neighbor, or in case you lose one, whatever, for whatever reason. So, it's just kind of neat. If you took brood out of, like, various stages of eggs, larva, cat, whatever, and put them in another box with another queen that's been laying, but those raise them as they <laughs> they don't, they don't yeah, they haven't come I don't think it sense like genetically, like, well, I guess only if they're... Yeah, but it's, it's like, um, you would think it's a bigger deal, but it's not a big deal, really. If they emerge in that hive, they're... That's going to be home. That's crazy. It's like the ugly duckling, you know? It's a duckling. It's not one of the... Like, it's 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 are you shaking the bees before you move them into the like when you're if you're using these for like let's let's assume you want to 
able to use the setup, and then maybe not so much for the clean area, just for the, the brood production, most or some of your other colonies. Um, are you shaking these off? Like, how are you, how are you juggling to you know, give that clean enough resources left behind so that she's not getting, getting in the left of lurch? Well, you figure um, in the daytime, all the flyers are foraging. Okay, so that population is not here when you're pulling frame out. So you can do it either way. You can shake the bees off and just transfer eggs. Uh, it just depends. If this thing is crowded like crazy, I mean, sometimes they they have uh, they have. This isn't um, these aren't crowded as it would be in the summertime. But in the summertime, like this is all white cappings. It is packed. I mean, when you pull a frame out, honey, honey's coming off both sides because they just they pack it so tight. You're like, shoot, they don't need all the bees. Then you can just transfer the bees and the um, bark or cat root. I mean, it's just one of those decisions that you have to make then. Because um, they, can, they, can they can get it going. I mean, it's just, you know, this is, this is winter, it's December. Um, so they went through some stores, and then somewhere, you know, they didn't build it all the way out to the sidewall. Um, but I've had them that, that there's no there's no space in here. Getting these frames out would be tough because they got so packed. But that, I don't know. Um, they'll make it. And sometimes you take enough bees out, you can you can take a day off. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I I said you know what this queen red thing is. Bird, <laughs> <laughs> That's what's working. So, uh, when you typically make your first, like, your first box like this, like what's 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 been your time like you know, over the last couple years? What, what would you say your average is when you first start the grab and when you end up with a, with a, a box like this? Um, you talking about how many queens? Uh, I mean, when, when, you, when do you, you know, you say game lines and get down the or when, when is that typically hidden? And then, you know, when would you, when would you have this set up up and running, like, you know? Well, um, the thing of it is, is that you need to make sure half this equation of drones. And so, if you don't have drones, then she got nothing to make with. Okay, so you can't do it too, too early. Um, and, to mate, you got to have, uh, it's got to be 69 degrees or higher, and the winds can't be too strong. So there's a lot that goes on in the whole scheme of things. There's, the queen is only half of the genetics. So there's a whole other part where you raise uh, <coughs> drones you know, in the apiaries around your uh, queen ring operation to saturate the area so you have the right drones made with your queens. There's like, there's a whole lot more to it. Where I live, I got beekeepers all around, so um, I don't have to be too concerned with genetics. And theirs lived, and mine lived, and the survivors, I raised them well, that's all that's good enough. Um, but the thing of it is, you gotta have drones available, and you gotta have mating, uh, good temperature for mating. So 69 or higher, and the winds have to be not too strong. So he's got to time that out, and this year it might be later. I mean, it's the spring yeah. we're having now, it's crazy. I mean, I'm not sure when the dandelions are going to but that's the, that's the key. You see dandelions popping up. And you know, what you can do too is you can take and you can pull uh, the cappings off your drone brood, and when the drone have purple eyes, uh, is that drones are going to mature in 24 days. Queens are at 16, workers at 21. So you can pull the captains off your drone. When the drones are in the purple eye stage, they're going to advance, mature, and be ready to mate by the time your queen is ready to mate. So the purple eye stage for drone is another key. So if you see that, then you can start your grass. Yeah. But my thing is, you know, there's there's other variables that are like temperature and wind and rain. Uh, if you if you push it too early, um, you're using up your resources for a chance that may or may not happen for you. So I I prefer to I prefer to wait till I know this could be good um, because it takes resources and it gives me more time to get more resources. Um, 
and I know that I'm going to have good mating. Because, I mean, I don't know if you ever had like drone layer or not, but when your queen shows up and all you got are these bullet cells, that's things. So, and she's yours. <laughs> I like mine. I like, I like to smile, you know. I like it. So, I, I like to wait. I have another friend in Delaware who was like, man, when are you going to start? When are you going to start? I'm like, dude, starting early, chances of success. If you're patient and you wait, uh, you're going to get uh, well-reared and well-mated queens. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a tricky question. It all depends on the environmental sources. When the queens, when you have them in this box or the four, and you set it up, uh, is she she's part of the or is she not transmitted? Yeah, I'll put the um, I'll put a queen cell in here. So let me get there. I'll um this is what I'll do. This is uh, this is a number of frames, but my two framer, I'll do this. I'll put a queen cell between the two frames. Right. Um, she's gonna hatch out in a day or two, and when she does, um, she'll walk around about a week hardened up and take her mating flight. And come back in several days, she'll start laying. Um, you know, I don't like <coughs> cells in there like that. You can stick them in the, the wax uh, on the side like this. Um, the, only, the only thing I don't like about this is that you have a young queen in there. If you push that in, do you put pressure on her in a way that's not good? And if you push on the plastic part, you're probably fine. Um, but I say between the top bars, and that way I'll take any chance on Those folks are on the top of the floor. Yeah, um, basically that lip right there will sit right up there. And basically the plastic part hangs down probably around here and then the, the rest of the wax cell hangs down. Um, I have like primal part and you know put that about here mm -hmm. on the frame, but normally it wants to cock a little bit. So I just like set it right down so that lip is laying right there on top. And it works, it works pretty well. It's kind of a side question, but I wanted to talk a lot about the broad legs. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how that is part of what you're doing in the sense that, I mean, do you have to worry about your, your news getting infested with mics? Oh, or um, you're getting food breaks, and I'm not sure how you, you use those. I just wonder how you kind of, how that plays a role in the whole thing. Well, that is, um, I'm not sure where I'm at here on my slides, here we go. Um, that's this guy's philosophy. He says, if you wait till the summer solstice, and you pull your queen out, and you put her in a nuke, uh, and you let the parent high, which has all the resources, make your queens, you get good queens, and you break the brood cycle uh, of bees, which also breaks the brood cycle of mites, um, and then therefore it's a natural Mite control. Um, you know, I uh, people have argued that you pull that queen out and she laid an egg today. That egg's going to hatch 21 days later. How much of a break is it? So that argument is is out there. But if you think about why do African bees, African bees, not really have mite problems? Because they swarm so much. So. I think there's some merit to it. There is an argument there, but that's basically how I try to control mites: is break that food cycle um, to whatever degree of success. And then the nukes, do you find it's a problem? Where does it play? Like, depends on what you're trying to do the most. Yeah, um, I think the nuke, the nukes probably are a better. Um, have more chance of survivorship than do the 10 frames. Um, I'm not 100% sure, sure why, uh, but that new queen will lay eggs like crazy, and does she outbreed the mites? And then so maybe you do have losses, but she lays so proficiently that uh, it doesn't really matter because she has a ton of bees. I don't know those answers. You know, I, I, my thing has been, um, I teach biology, so there's a, a lot about, um, you know, natural selection and evolution and biology and uh, survival of the fittest and all those things. And 
so my my problem right now is do I let my weak bees that are susceptible to light to die and the strong ones I just keep breeding from them? Because you know it hurts to lose hives. But when you treat them, you're killing the weak mites and the strong mites live. What's the answer? You know, and I don't I don't know the answer, but that's the kind of the thing I'm playing with now, like do I just suck it up and keep on breeding? I don't know. But I haven't treated, so there's so much bee exchange in the mix too because you're moving right out. Yes. You know, so any viruses that might come along with the mites aren't hanging around long because the bees that are in that little two frame are all moving out. True. True. Yep. Um, but this is fun. I mean, making nukes and, and, and trying this and that what you try. It's it's enjoyable. Like I said, when you got your that queen walks out, you know you that's your queen. There's, oh, it's just it's a feeling. I know you have a long way to drive, so we yep. want to thank you once again. There's some refreshments here. Grab something. Talk amongst yourselves. We don't have.